Welcome to Wellness Within. My name is Stevie Hanekel, and today we're hosting a very important conversation about clinical trials. This is to help cancer patients who are navigating treatment decisions so that you can gather more information and guidance from the experts. Joining us today is Chris Curl Johnston, and we have Dr. Deep Deep Bell, as well as Teresa McPherson. Welcome and thank you each for being here with us today. I will now introduce you to Patty Brown, our Wellness Within founder, and she's going to start with leading the questions for today. I am very grateful for all of you to um, offer your time to have this really important conversation. Clinical trials are something that I feel most people either don't know about, don't understand, how do I even find out about it? We'll talk about all that as we get in. But before we start, would you mind telling a little bit more about each other? If we can talk, start with Dr. Bell, would you be willing to share a little bit more? I know that you're medical oncology, hematology at Sutter Medical, but can you say a little bit more about yourself? Yes, sure, thank you. So yes, like you said, I am a medical oncologist. I see uh, mostly lung cancer and melanoma in my practice and some head and neck. And I am also the medical director for the Sutter Institute for Medical Research so I am heavily involved with clinical trials. Wonderful. Okay. And um, Chris, can you say a little bit more about yourself? Sure. So I am the program manager for uh, UC Davis's phase one clinical trials program, but also program manager for the Sacramento Citywide Oncology phase one program. So I'm sort of the face of the program. Uh, when Dr. Bell has a patient, she will call me. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and okay. I have over 30 years experience in clinical trials and medical education in various different realms. Wow, I'm sure you have seen a lot of changes over that time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Understatement, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we have Teresa, and, and I know you, Teresa, and I'm so so happy to see you. <laughs> so would you oh, talk- good to see you? <laughs> I, would you mind telling our listeners a little bit more about you? Um, my name is Teresa McPherson and um, I am a, a cancer survivor. I um, am a triple negative breast cancer survivor from 11 years ago and I had melanoma six years ago. So I'm, I'm well and I am a benefactor of clinical trials. So I think it's important that, um, you know, I represent not only um, the American Cancer Society, and I'm also a reformed cancer researcher. So <laughs> I did a lot of genomics in my time. Um, but I think as a patient and as a patient advocate for clinical trials, I think think that I am so happy to be here and to um, answer some questions and represent the patients in this case. I had realized that you were part of a clinical trial. Yeah, that's news to me. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, right. Teresa awesome. is also on, on our executive board as a patient advocate as well for the, wow. the SCOPE program. So for our listeners- so she serves uh, a lot in our community. Yeah, that is- so for our listeners and viewers, I should say as well, um, you've got some pretty good experience here from um, all three of these people who are willing to give their time to really help us understand clinical trials so much better. Um, so let's start. First thing first, what are the possible advantages that one can experience by participating in a clinical trial? Anybody? Uh, Okay, I'll, I'll get started. Uh, so, you know, I see there are many benefits, but I will highlight three benefits which come to mind. Uh, the first I will say is that, of course, especially in the cancer world, sometimes being on a clinical trial is the only way to access a novel therapy. So a treatment that may be looking promising may not yet be on the market. So if the patient gets on a trial, then uh, there's a good chance that they can access that. So it can be personally beneficial. Then secondly, I think what helps the patient also is uh, sort of an indirect uh, benefit is that, you know, of course, we as the treating physician and the uh, team on the patient side are trying to do our best. But by being on a clinical trial, there's an, another extra set of eyes looking at the scans, looking at the reports, making sure everything is going well. 
So there's that extra, you know, scrutiny of the chart, which I think is in the patient's benefit. And I think uh, most, if not all of my patients feel that, you know, I'm having to walk this very difficult road. What can I do to help someone who comes after me? And mm -hmm. enrolling on clinical trial is a way to give back and uh, make things a little bit smoother for the person who follows in this unfortunate path. Yeah, if, if I can, yeah, if I can hop in too, as yeah, a patient, sure. I, I always say, um, talk to their doctor and say, is their clinical trial right for me? And, and one of the benefits as a patient is um, you're, you've got other eyes looking at you. You've, you're being followed. It's like you have an expert team that is watching you all the time. And in this way, I was more comforted because, you know, as everybody knows, when you've got a cancer diagnosis, you're afraid it's coming back or the, the next scan is going to be the one that tells you bad news. Yeah. Well, having those extra eyes and those expert ex experts caring for you, it as a patient, it just is reassuring and helpful. And, and as Dr. Bell said, patients want to give back and, and this is a way to kind of accomplish a lot. So um, yeah, it, I always was comforted by it. So Okay, so when you find out, or I should, let me rephrase that, how do patients find out about clinical trials? Is it from their oncologist or some, somebody else, you know, they just happen to hear about something, they listen to a webinar, I mean, how, how do, what's the norm? How do people find out? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on this one, if you don't mind. Um, the best place to start is really with the treating oncologist. You know, most of the centers in oncology, almost all of them do clinical research right there within their own institution. And clinical trials can be more complicated. You do have all those extra sets of eyes, but you also have lots of extra blood draws and extra biopsies and a lot of other things. So staying as close to home is to everybody's advantage as possible. So starting with the local oncologist, you know, just asking. As Teresa said, you know, could there maybe be a clinical trial for me? And if there isn't, that's where a program like the Scope Partnership comes into play. Mm -hmm. You know, we might have something that Sutter doesn't. And we've actually done the reverse. UC Davis has sent patients to Sutter for clinical trials mm -hmm. um, through this partnership. So it, it's sort of, we, we want to really work together to make sure that there is a network of trials that are available for people that can stay close to home. Um, I think I get a lot of phone calls from all over the country. I get even phone calls and emails from outside of the country asking about clinical trials. And most of the time, that kind of, the, the logistics are not workable when we're talking about that much travel. So I really recommend starting with a local oncologist. But friends, American Cancer Society, there's a lot of different resources and we can get into that for finding clinical trials as well. So what can participants expect once they uh, are entering a clinical trial? What would you say? And I know there's probably different arms to that question, but what's the easiest way to say, well, what, these are the things that you can, what you can expect when you enter a trial. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bell, do you have anything that you can share yeah, on that? So what I, sure. So what I tell my patients is uh, when you're getting on a clinical trial, you are, you can be sure that you will at least get standard of care because one big fear is I'm going to, you know, agree to be on a clinical trial and I will not even get treatment. I'll get a sugar pill. So that's not true. And I think it's very important to address those unspoken fears because, you know, we, we know they are there. So mm -hmm. the first thing is at the very minimum by signing up on the clinical trial, you will at least get the care you would have got anyway. Uh, but by signing up on clinical trial, like Teresa said, you will only get extra, like an extra pair of eyes looking at your scans, extra pair of eyes looking at your labs and saying, you know, you're good to continue on the trial. And you may be able to access a new drug that's looking promising. So I think uh, what can patients expect? They can expect at least what they would have got anyway, plus some extra, uh, you know, pair of eyes looking over their chart. But it is also true that on the flip side, they can also expect to do some maybe extra scans they may otherwise may not have needed to do. Sometimes it's even a little more onerous that maybe a biopsy is needed to be on the trial. So there may be extra things to do by signing up on the trial. 
Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good point. Cause that was one of the things I was, I was curious about. I mean, cancers vary, you know, cancers are very different from each other. Um, and so I wonder if there is additional procedures one cancer may have that another one won't have. And so, I mean, it really feels like it's very dependent on the cancer type. Is that true for the most part? Very dependent on the cancer type, very dependent upon the cancer type. And then mm. also many of the cancers nowadays too, we're finding these molecular drivers and we're developing agents that can target that driver and block it. And so, you know, there, there is a lot of extra screening and sometimes even in the realm where I really work in the, the early phase clinical trials, we don't really randomize much to standard treatment, you know, plus a placebo standard treatment, plus the investigational agent. It's almost always just the investigational agent and maybe some other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is depending upon the type of cancer again, um, a lot of it is very targeted and we're looking, sometimes we're even looking at brand new targets or tissue factor expressions that we're just figuring out how to target and seeing if we can stop the cancer growth that way. So definitely a lot of biopsies, a lot of blood draws. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would imagine but, too. Um, yeah. It gets complicated. There's a lot of layers to it. Yeah. I think too, though, the things we also want to bring up maybe is the informed consent process. So I know when I get phone calls from patients, they think if they come, they are committing to the trial. That's yeah. not true. You're going to come, you're going to be evaluated. It's possible that our investigator, our physician investigator, you know, our counterparts to Dr. Bell might say, I don't like that trial for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter that the, you're not excluded from the trial, but that treatment, I don't like it for you. And I think you should go home and just get standard treatment. Um, it, that does happen. So there's that part. The doctor has to agree <laughs> that's yeah. the next best treatment option for you and recommend it. And then the, the patient and the family are given the opportunity to go through what we call the informed consent process. It's very lengthy. It's very overwhelming. Anybody who's had surgery before knows what those are like, this is that on steroids. So they are very lengthy. They're very, very detailed, right down to how many teaspoons of blood throughout the whole trial they're gonna take, you know, very, very detailed. And then patients have a choice. They can say, I love it, I'm gonna sign up, or I hate it and tear it up and get a second opinion instead. Or they can say, can I take this home and talk to my family about it? Because there is a lot of extra here that's, and I'm gonna need my family's help to make this work. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can take that paper home with you and call us back later. Those are your choices. It's always a choice. And, um, and I think that that is the piece that patients also want to know is you're going to know more than you want to know, more than you can even hold in your head. <laughs> we have to yeah. tell you about. Yeah. So, and yeah. once you sign, you also get a copy of that consent form as well. And it's so this, that is this is a hospital's legal requirement. I'm sorry. Um, is that is this hospital specific? I mean, is it um, that you always go to a certain hospital, or is it vary, or is there? Yeah, Dr. Bell, I don't know what if you want to take this. There's a lot of legalities around clinical trials. Yeah. There's a lot of regula regulations. Yeah. And so the physician who is managing the care of the patient on trial, it doesn't mean that all the other physicians out there aren't right, mm -hmm. but they cannot legally conduct this research. This researcher, this physician is legally responsible for the conduct of that trial. Got it. And you do have to see that, go to that institution for that particular trial. So okay. like our patient, when we sent him to Dr. Bell, our patient had to go to Sutter. When Dr. Bell has a patient for us, the patient comes to us. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. All right. And so- But I will add, uh, Patty, if I may add, there are a lot yeah, of trials please. which are- a lot of trials are now nationwide because we have these big uh, consortiums where oncologists are working together. Uh, sometimes pharma companies will open in multiple sites. So your own physician, your own oncologist may be the local PI anyway. So you don't always have to go to a different hospital to seek care or you can many times, in fact, I would say, you know, more often than not, you can stay where you're getting your care. And it may be one of trials which is open at multiple centers that you can 
keep your team and keep your yeah. nurses you know, and, and be on the clinical trial. Yeah. And the informed consent, I will uh, just say that I always encourage patients to take it home because uh, I personally like it that they don't, I tell them about the trial and they sign right there. No, take it home, think about it. And then we are available, come back and, you know, ask what questions the family had, you have. And when you're comfortable, then sign up. Is, um, if people are coming from far away, and I know we're in the Sacramento region, um, but if someone lives up three hours and they have to come into the major hospitals in, in this area, is there, um, so there's travel involved and, and how does that work? I mean, is there times when you don't want them coming as, as often as they might need to? Is there nurses that can go into the home and do blood draws or scans, not, not scans, but uh, maybe an EKG or whatever? Is, is that something that also can be included in a trial if someone has to travel far? So it depends not. upon what, what the procedure is. Okay. Um, so obviously like a, you know, we do have a lot of patients that come out of Reading. We've had patients come from Chicago <laughs> on our trials. Okay. So, yeah. um, you know, and so there are some things, what we call the routine care. Routine care means that it would be done whether you were on getting clinical trial treatment or you were getting standard treatment. There's always going to be scans. There's always going to be labs. A lot of times those can be done at home, mm -hmm. you know, with the home oncologist. And if there's a home health provider that, you know, can go out and do the blood draws, that's fine uh, for just routine labs. But there's other ones, research ones, where it's not feasible because we've got to grab that vial and run to the lab immediately yeah, with sure. it. And so those, the patient does have to come in. Mm -hmm. um, and there can be some reimbursement. Most pharmaceutical some companies will reimburse patients for travel expenses. Uh, and then there's multiple different other services as well. I know Sutter has a wonderful palliative care team. We have a good supportive oncology team that uh, American Cancer Society actually just gave us a nice $15,000 grant for travel nice. expenses <laughs> for patients to give them gas cards. So, um, and then we do have, a, I, I'm sure Sutter does too. We have agreements with some local hospitals as well, or local motels and hotels as well. So it's at least cheaper, less expensive to stay when they yeah. need to. I know that's a concern because I think a lot of people don't understand. I'm sorry, Dr. Bell, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say that, you know, but I will say that this is a sore point when it comes to clinical trials. I see a book behind Teresa, which says cancer disparities, <laughs> I think. And this is very much a reason for disparity, you know, living far from a cancer center has actually been shown by research to lower the rate of clinical trial enrollment and for good reason, because you know travel, the time involved, the expense involved uh, is not trivial. So that does lead to disparity in care. Yeah, okay. Um, so one of the things I, I, I always, I think it gets confusing is, is when the people to understand placebo versus the real uh, experimental medicine you know, or the drug that's being administered or, you know, whatever. So can you kind of speak to that a little bit about how that, you know, for people to understand placebo versus, I mean, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that nobody really knows, you know, if, if you're getting the real thing or the placebo, as far as, I don't mean what you see in a person in, the re, in their reaction or something, you know, that you look for once the trial starts, but it's more, um, that information, you know, who, you know, who really has access to who has the placebo and who doesn't. Okay, shall I speak to that? Or? Yeah, yeah, please. Thanks. Oh, okay. You. Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, not every trial is a placebo controlled trial. So sometimes patients, physicians, everyone in the room knows exactly what you're getting. So it's not true that it is always the case that you won't even know what you're getting. Oh, that's so, so good many to know. Perfectly. Yes. So many times you perfectly know what you're getting and the placebo trials are appropriate only in situations where otherwise you have got, you would have got nothing. Like for example, a stage three lung cancer trial where immunotherapy is now standard of care, but used to be not the standard of care. So what was done is patients got chemotherapy and radiation, and then they were done. 
So in that situation, when the standard of care is to do nothing, then it is appropriate to match with the placebo. Like some people get the immunotherapy, some people get you know, the placebo and no one knows who's getting what. So only in those kind of situations will you not know if you're getting placebo or real drug because as standard of care, you would have done neither. You would have basically just been under observation. Okay. And then who, who has access to this information? The clinical pharmacist still has access. So let's say some bad side effect happened then it is mandated that I should be unblinded, the patient should be unblinded. Unblinded meaning that I should be told that this patient was on the real drug. The patient is told, yes, you were on the real drug. So we can appropriately manage whatever side effect came up. So it ah, is not true great. that no harm will come out of not being told. If there is any harm being perceived, then you will be told what drug you're on. And you know your care will not, this is our, you know, uh, promise to our patients like when they put their trust in us then of course it is in you know it is imperative that we do not compromise their well-being in any way and and we don't mm, okay chris do you have anything to add to that um only that you know really in other areas they do use placebos more and even yeah. there you can't just get a sugar pill and and ha yeah. yeah have yeah. treatment withheld that's just illegal we can't do that um, but in, particularly in cancer trials, we don't really use many placebos, actually. Oh, Sometimes wow. we will very late, you know, we've really established that this, this investigational agent is effective, but now we want to know, is it more effective than the standard treatment? Oh, right. Then sometimes okay. they'll do placebo, you know, but, but it's really rare in cancer trials to use. Most of them don't. Okay. I, so I, it's less I, of a concern in cancer trials. That makes sense. I was uh, in my mind thinking about a, a someone that I had known for a very long time and know uh, the spouse um, is that he had uh, geoblastoma and he participated in a clinical trial where he had unfortunately had the placebo and that stuck in my head. That's why I was curious about how does this work? And I would imagine all cancers are different. And so I really appreciate you clarifying they are. that. Yeah. And in that case, probably as Dr. Bell was talking about, it's the same thing with very early stage chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Watch and wait is the standard of care for that. Sure. So that because sense. we found if we get treatment too early, we just blow out the bone marrow. And so, you know, in that case, or like your friend with the, the glioblastoma probably had the surgery and now they wanted to see if they could prevent recurrence. That's right. But really after surgery, there is no therapy that is recommended. Right. So in that case, it's appropriate to maybe do a placebo versus the investigational thing mm -hmm. to see if you, you decrease or uh, increase the time to recurrence. That would be appropriate. But yeah, somebody who has an active cancer that would normally be getting, you know, standard treatment, we can never withhold treatment. That's just, I mean, it, nobody here would even want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> even if it yeah. wasn't illegal and come with many big fines. And, uh, you know, I always joke, I look terrible in orange. It's not my color. Um, <laughs> so. Well, it's very encouraging to hear that. I'm really, that, this is great. Um, and what about levels like there's clinical trials there's uh, phase one phase two phase three what is can you explain a little bit of what that means exactly that one i am gonna take um because again this is another area where cancer is different than everybody else uh -huh. uh, because we're in an era of targeted therapy like i was talking about we find that molecular target and we target it um there's literally been fda approvals based on phase one clinical trials data so phase one is is one of the earlier stages of, of the testing uh they're not always first in human in fact very few of them are first in human uh, mm -hmm. and it'll be right in the title if it is <laughs> so you always know if it's first in human uh most phase one clinical trials do have a little bit of you know what we call the the dose escalation and I always tell patients, you know, that's where, you know, basic, mo the most common design is three patients at a time on a dose. So as Dr. Bell pointed out, these trials can sometimes be conducted in many centers, globally even, not even just here in the States. And so, you know, you enroll three patients around the world on that trial, and everybody just sits and waits and sees how those three patients will do for the next month. 
And if they do great, then we're going to add three more patients at the next higher dose. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it goes. So there's dose escalation. And then with phase ones now in cancer specifically, once you reach that target dose, then you go into what we call an expansion. It's almost like a phase two where we're just going to enroll a whole bunch more patients at that dose. And now we're looking at efficacy. We're really looking at how effective it is. And um, yeah, like I said, in cancer specifically, it's just been a game changer. Phase ones literally have led to FDA indications. Um, the uh, ASCO put out an article a couple of years ago that was showing that most phase ones actually demonstrate about a 20% overall response rate, which to talk about response rates in phase ones is that's not how it used to be. It was mm. all about safety in the past. Yeah. Phase good. two, sometimes companies just skip phase two, <laughs> but that's usually when they enroll a whole bunch more patients uh, on that treatment. And it, then safety is, they're still looking at it, of course, but they're really looking for the efficacy signal. And then if they don't get the FDA indication there, they might go to the phase three, which is okay. We know it's effective, but it is more effective than what we've already got out there. Um, but as said, some of the Keytruda is one of them that was FDA approved on phase one data, never even went to phase two or phase three because the response rates were so stellarly, markedly different. Same thing with um, Venetoclax. I forget what its brand name is, but uh, it's used in, in AML and CLL. And same thing, they went from phase one FDA <laughs> mm, <laughs> approval. Okay. For the indications because it just was so remarkably different than what we already had. So I think the biggest risk of a phase one, and I always tell patients this, I would want to know if they're still in dose escalation and if they are, are they still in first doses? Because your biggest risk in dose escalation, it's not getting too much drug, it's not getting enough if they're really early in the dose escalation. So, and some protocols will allow the patient to then, you know, if it's shown that the higher dose is more effective and still safe, some protocols allow those patients that started at the low dose to go to the next, that higher dose, others don't. So that's what I would wanna know about a phase one trial. Where are they? If they're in dose escalation, are we in the first doses? And if it turns out that there's a higher dose that has better efficacy, can I get switched to that? Those are the biggest things that I would want to know if I were going on to a phase one clinical trial. Otherwise, I, especially if they're at expansion, I would not be concerned about safety, certainly. Wow, that's a that's a great concise answer. I appreciate that because it can get <laughs> it can get confusing. You know, like, what does that mean? What does and that mean? I felt like that was a long answer, but yeah, it's, it's the most common thing running a phase one program. That's the most common thing that I have to talk about. I bet. So. I bet. And so what happens? Um, and I'd be curious, Teresa, because you all, you know, experience being in a clinical trial yourself, what happens at the point where a patient, all of a sudden it becomes obvious they're not, they're, they're worsening, their symptoms are worsening. So is it, is it upon the people running the trial, the oncologist or the patient to be able to say, I don't feel good, I don't like this, you know, or how, how does that work? I think that, um, and Dr. Bell can definitely hop in on this too. I think it's, it's a team approach. The patient, if the patient's not feeling well or has certain weird symptoms that that communication between the patient and the PI or oncologist is, is so vital because um, the patient knows when, and I, several times, I just needed perspective. I needed to know that um, what was happening was normal, right? And because it's, it's kind of a new protocol and maybe, you know, everything you had been going through with your, your chemotherapy or your radiation, you, you get into kind of a groove and you know what to expect every time you go for a treatment. And then when you try something new, you want to know, you want to be reassured that um, this is to be acted. You, you are okay. You're, you're not an outlier. You're not presenting with something that's um, way more terrible that because as the patient, you're imagining the worst, right? Um, and so I think that communication with the uh, oncologist is 
absolutely paramount. And um, again, another thing to love about being on a clinical trial is having that communication with the, the team. Would you like to hop in, Dr. Bell? Most of the time, like when to stop is, of course, the patients, you know, how they are feeling is very, very important, but it's usually spelled out in the protocol itself that if such and such parameter is met, then the patient has to be off trial. So usually it is already pre-decided that if you're not doing at least this well, you will be off the trial. And uh, yeah, it's very much, uh, you know, it's not on the patient at all to like decide, you know, do I continue, do I stop? Uh, it is the physician's uh, job and role to see how they're feeling, of course, but also see if their parameters are okay to keep going on with whatever treatment has been. There done. are a lot of rules and, um, you know, sometimes it can be frustrating for the patient because they are on the trial and they're feeling good about it. And, um, and then something happens that can kick them off. And in my case, I was kicked off of one of my trials because I presented with a second primary cancer that had no effect on anything else. It was the melanoma. The, my trial didn't cause the melanoma. The sun caused the melanoma when I was a little kid. Uh, and so that, that kicked me off of one of my trials. I was mad as a hornet because I was like, what I've put in all this time. I've been so careful. I was a completely client, a uh, compliant patient. And, and, and to the point where everybody that worked with me were like, oh, we love, cause I filled out all of my diaries. I did everything just as I was supposed to. And then this stupid melanoma kicks me off my trial. I was pretty mad, but that even something like that can kick you off the trial. So all of these factors weigh in. All right, everyone. Well, we switched locations here a little bit. If you notice, it's a little different in my background. Um, Teresa and Chris and Dr. Bell are in the same place, but we had little glitches on our end on our internet. So um, that's why we have a different background at the moment. So we um, took a pause before we entered the next um, topic, which I think is really important, and it's about communication. And communication is one of those, from my perspective, having at the center here, having a lot of people come in and talk about what they don't know. And I, and I always have to say, talk to your team, and do they know that? And so I, I find that this to be also a very important part of talking about clinical trials. So um, we already answered the question about how someone finds out about clinical trials and all that, but when a, who's informing who? Like who's informing the patient about what's going on? We're seeing this or because of your, you know, your blood draw or whatever. Who, where is the main communication to the patient coming from? So I would say that in our setup, the main communication is coming from the clinical research associate. So every trial, there will be, of course, the clinical team, the nurse will be there, I will be there. Uh, but another very important person of the research team is the clinical research associate. Uh, the person who meets with the patient right the very first visit uh, usually is the one taking them to the lab to say, you know, make sure that the study blood tests are collected or whatever needs to be done. Uh, communicates with the fusion center to set up times. So that is a very key person when, when it is clinical trials. But that doesn't mean the rest of the team is inaccessible. I mean, everyone is available. But uh, on a clinical trial, the clinical research associate is a key player for the patient and the team. It's the same here as well in other centers that I've worked in. Uh, the, the research coordinator, you know, there, there's always contact information that is given to the patient because we, we know life happens, you know, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, somebody's on a clinical trial, but during a break between treatment, they want to go to Texas to see their grandkids or something. Yeah. And then yeah. something happens and they land in the hospital. There's always contact information of how to get a hold of everybody. Um, so the other thing that I thought of in this question is how are patients informed about changes? Like we've yes. learned that, you know, this might happen and we didn't expect it before. Yeah. Those come in and, you know, they, they have to be submitted through our, our institutional review boards. They have to go through an approval process. 
And then we are told we have to document that the patient was informed and the patient signs that they were informed. And we have to show that in our audits. Mm. You know, it's normal. The, the clinical trials are audited regularly by the FDA, by the NCI, you know, different people will come in and, and audit not just the data, yeah. but also the regulations. Are we following the regulations that we need to follow? And so that's where that comes in. You know, yes, we informed the patient, all yeah. patients on that trial learned that there was new information that we didn't have before and they have to sign. So it's a, it, that is another way in which patients are informed. I, I, and then two, as, as data is actually reported on clinicaltrials.gov, which is a listing of all of the clinical trials that are going on throughout the United States, they have to be on there mm -hmm. before we can start enrolling people as well as a whole bunch of other stuff that people don't necessarily need to know about. But when data is actually published, there is a section. When you look up the study, there's a section where you can see the reports. Oh, wow. And the data. You know, so, just hearing, hearing that, uh, feels so reassuring, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, look, there's a lot of eyes on this. There's a lot of accountability yeah. here, folks. So it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Th that's a great message. That's really important, I think. Um, does anybody have anything else to add to that? No. Okay. Um, what about the other participants in the trial? You know, because support groups are really uh, important for a lot of folks who are dealing with cancer. And clinical trials are smaller, especially I know locally it may be more dispersed, like you said, someone can come in from Chicago, but is there support groups, you know, locally that may be involved in a trial that get together or is it made available to them? I think there are a lot of support groups for clinical trial participants, but I don't know of many that are just for a specific trial. Oh, so you're okay. not you're in general, you're not going to be getting together to chat with other people on your trial, okay. but there are resources for folks on clinical trials just to kind of, you know, talk about how do you, how do you feel about being on a trial? How is your family supporting you in those ways and, and things like that. Um, but every hospital, especially in, in the Sacramento area, um, Everybody has really wonderful supportive oncology teams with social work and um, you know nurse navigators and and people that are supportive and can connect you to other patients that are similar in your diagnosis or on trial. Um, yeah, most support groups, there is one in the Sacramento area that is very specific to clinical trials, mm -hmm. and that is run by Bob Rose. Right. Um, and I forget the name of his support group, but he's also one of our patient advocates on the scope board. But the rest of the, most of the rest of the clinical trials, or the support groups in our area are really disease specific. Mm -hmm. And they, a lot of Sometimes have patients, you know, within that. I mean, that's one of the things that I do is I sometimes talk to support groups about a particular trial that's going on mm. to make patients aware of it. Um, so definitely clinical trials are a discussion within the support groups. So uh, if someone is struggling and is scared or has something going on with them, who's the person that they would want to go to immediately? That clinical research coordinator. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, it's That's team I and I want to keep repeating these things and um, yeah. because I, I really think people need to keep hearing this messaging mm -hmm. is that you are not alone in that. And I think some people um, will think, oh, the doctor's going to be too busy. I'll never be able to talk to them. It's like, no, you have your person, right? Yeah. That there's going to be somebody there just for this trial that you can talk to that will be there for you. Exactly. And I think that's the, that's and, the and message I want people to hear. Yeah, and that person acts as a liaison to the rest of the care team as well. So, yeah, definitely that coordinator becomes, you know, the, or some people call them clinical research coordinators or clinical research associates. Mm -hmm. They're the same thing. That mm -hmm. person is your person. They're going to be helping to coordinate your care. Um, they will, you know, if, if let's say a participant is even saying, no, I'm not having side effects from the, the trial. I'm just having a lot of anxiety around my cancer. 
yeah. or my loved ones yeah. and family dynamics. Yeah. That right. research coordinator can still go to the physician and get the help from those supportive oncology people. Yeah. You know, the social workers and, you know, get services, not just for the patient, but also the patient's family. That's, oh, that's very awesome. important that's because so a lot of times I think that the caregivers uh, don't always, re you know, they're, they're an important part of this yes. and there are resources available for them. They're yes. part of the team. So, yeah, absolutely. I can remember someone coming in here a few years ago and his wife was on a trial and he took me aside and he said, she's having hip pain. She's never had hip pain and she won't say anything about it. Should I say something about it? And so just <laughs> to your point, right. You know, a, a person who is living in the home with that person and taking care of, it's like, they have anxiety too. Mm -hmm. They do. Um, the other thing, you know, you just brought up a really good point too. It's really important when you're on a clinical trial to be honest about what's going on with you. It may not be related at all, but it could be. Right. We've got to know. You don't hide anything. We've yeah. got to know. We, we often have patients that'll, you know, how are you doing, Mrs. Jones? And she's like, oh, pretty good. And her, her partner or her caregiver is like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're not pretty good. Exactly. And, and so, and, and being able to watch those interactions is, is priceless and encouraging that communication because then usually Mrs. Jones will come clean and say that she's had this, this happening and that happening. Maybe she's not eating as well, or maybe she's presenting with, you know, various other side effects. And it's so important that everybody knows about whatever's going on. If there's a rash, if, if there's anything, even so something so simple, mm -hmm. um, it's important that everybody knows. Yeah. And yeah. And I, I think that's so, so important. Um, it, it's because I think, how do I say this is for those viewing this is to be able to make a deal with your caregiver, your spouse, your partner, your adult child, whoever that is to say, we're in this together. And so if you see something that I may not see because I don't want a reason to that I'll get kicked off the trial, it's probably important, you know? I mean, so I, I think that kind of level of partnership, is that a message that anybody gives to like, say a couple comes in or the two people that says, you're both welcome to share information. I think so. I, and even as a patient, um, and I've done a lot of advocacy work. I've been caregiver. I've, I've done a lot of this, but when I was diagnosed, I was like, okay, I'm the patient. It's all on all of you. I'm just going to do follow the rules and I'm going to, you know, mm. do everything I can to stay well and get better and keep putting one foot in front of the other, but it's on all of you to take care of me. And um, it worked out. So, you know, but I, you know, without my husband, without my oncology team and my clinical trials people, I mean, I, I just put all my trust. You have to trust some in that trust yeah. with your team is, I, I, I feel like that um, trust is another element of your success in your survivorship. Yeah, that's a that's great. I'm glad that you said that, Teresa, because I think that's people need to hear that. I think that's very trust is important. And you get that, I would think, over time by the rhythm of the communication and the active involvement. Yeah, and I will, you know, absolutely second that having trust is key to being on, even if you know, not even clinical trial, just mm -hmm. making uh, the most of uh, you know, all the care that you're getting, having the trust is most important. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't so mean moving on to the top of, of qual, oh, I'm sorry, Chris, do you have some more you want to add to that? It doesn't mean that you don't ask questions though. Oh, yeah. Ask questions. I mean, that's and, how the trust and comes. And understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, that that is good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so I think sometimes patients misinterpret when we say have trust, that, yeah. that means you can communicate, you know, yeah. you don't have to just be silent to let them, you know, guide you along. Yeah. You need to understand what's happening. Well, I would say, yeah, I would say it is on us to earn that trust. It is not on them to just give it to us. We have to earn it. And Patty, I really like the point you brought up that the, uh, 
you know, do you ask the husband if the wife has cancer, like how is she doing? Like bring in the caregiver into the conversation because it's very true that sometimes the patient is scared to tell you because they think you might say, okay, you're doing too poorly. You can't be on this clinical trial, mm -hmm. which is not, you know, most of the time, not true. It's much better that you tell us exactly what's happening. So we work with it. Uh, but yeah, many times patients have that fear. So the caregiver voice becomes even more important because they see it from the outside and they can, yeah. you know, sometimes give a more objective report of what's happening. Yeah, exactly. Great point. That's really, really important information. Um, we already talked about moving into the topic of qualifications, um, but just because we talked a little bit about how do you qualify for a trial, um, you know, you know, looking at what current treatments are unsuccessful and all that, are there, I don't think, that, as I'm thinking through this question, even it feels like it's not a one size fit all. So it's like qualifications vary. Like, okay, someone has um, Ewing sarcoma, all right, which we, we know that's tough, <laughs> you know, it's a, but where, you know, if there are stage two, or stage three or stage four? I mean, is there a cutoff point where you, these decisions get made? Yeah, it depends upon the trial. Okay. Um, you know, the trials are usually de designed to try to be successful. So, um, you know, if it's, if, uh, you know, they're looking at something that is appropriate for an earlier stage, then that's what they're, the patients they're gonna look for. If they are looking in the area where we don't have anything good, mm -hmm. then they might go more for very advanced patients. Um, and that's a lot of times where phase one clinical trials comes in. It's not end of, end of the road, you don't have any more treatments left. That's not usually part of the, the criteria for any clinical trial. Okay. Some want brand new diagnosis, no treatment at all. Others, you know, want one or two treatments. So it's very specific depending upon where they think they can have the greatest success. Um, the other thing that I always, uh, that comes up a lot in my conversations, especially with the caregivers, is patients will be bedridden and they're hoping that they can get their loved one on a clinical trial. That's an yeah. extremely common phone call. Unfortunately, because we need to get good data out of this, we need to be able to tease out the effects of the cancer from the effects of the treatment. So yeah. we need people who are still able to pretty much take care of themselves at least 50 to 75% of the day. Okay. Maybe they need to take a few more naps. They don't have to run marathons or anything like that. They don't even necessarily have to be working, but, um, but they can live on their own independently and they're up and doing their thing. We need them to be relatively, still relatively robust. And do, can they continue on the treatments that they're currently on to get on a trial or do they have to stop those treatments? They usually have to stop. Okay. It depends upon the design. If it's a maintenance trial where mm -hmm. we want to see if we add something to it, um, then they, they could maybe be on the, the same treatment. But usually most of them, the time to talk about a clinical trial is when it's time to talk about treatment, a new treatment. That's the time to be looking for a clinical trial. You know, um, as a patient, but as a, as a person who um, has worked with a lot of cancer centers, I think one of the things that I would advocate for is that to be a conversation right after you get your diagnosis to say, um, we're going to start your treatment plan. We're going to figure out what's best for you. Would you be interested if there is an appropriate clinical trial? Mm -hmm. And 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 along the way, if we find something that we will we'll think is interesting for you or might help you or benefit your your survivorship, would you be interested in talking to us about that? And that just plants a seed that for the oncologist in that team, then they know that okay, this person is interested, and for the patient, it also plants the seed that maybe there's another. Maybe there's another option and at some point I'll bring it up, right? And so yeah. I think having those conversations begin early because sometimes when you have a conversation about a clinical trial kind of into the process, the patient's like, whoa, 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 
am I, am I at the end? Yeah. Is there right, nothing else right. that can help me? Right. And so then you have to have those conversations of no, these trials are for to help you get better. It's not the end of life, all of these kinds of things. So that avoids that feeling of, oh, I'm, I'm only getting the trial because it's the end for me. This helps keep it, the trial as a positive experience. Yeah, yeah, that's a great frame. Of, that is a really great frame to put around it. And I mean, I have heard, I think what's important what you're saying, Teresa, too, is so many people go like, how do I know if I, how do, how, nobody's talked to me about a clinical trial, you know, if, if I mention it, you know, or something, which I rarely do, but I might um, have read something or someone else, you know, at the center is going through a clinical trial and they're very similar cases. It's like, hey, do, do, have you asked your doctor about whether or not there's any clinical trials? Like, what's a clinical trial? And so it's like, it is, it is hard to have, you know, to know, because not everyone is going to say, what you were just saying about would you be interested in a clinical trial one came available you know so it's almost like patient advocacy which i know we're going to talk about next is is getting people you know is it's armed you know is getting them to ask questions getting them to learn but it, it's challenging that's right um so speaking of patient advocacy what is that what's a, what's a patient i mean i i know what it is but I think our, our uh, viewers and listeners would probably love to know about patient advocacy when it has to do with a trial. So um, the patient advocate is typically a person who's been through a cancer diagnosis that has, in my case, had two, been on two clinical trials. Mm. Um, and I am able to be that voice for the patients. So um, I'm, I also, I am a, a member of the SCOPE Sacramento area-wide phase one clinical trial program. I am um, on several other uh, programs as a patient that can have a voice and keep the patients um, at the center or at the table it, and um, make sure that, you know, a lot of times I am married to a cancer researcher um, they are very data driven and especially when they're um, in the lab or they're a bioinformatics person, they, they don't have a face that goes with that data. And so I am that face that says, you know, hang on, there are patients out here and uh, we, we deserve to be heard and um, pay attention to us. And it helps them as mm -hmm. researchers and as oncologists to know that there's someone on the other end of that data. And, um, and that, so that's my job. There are a lot of advocates out there um, and a, a lot of advo patient advocacy programs. The um, metastatic breast cancer group has amazing advocacy. They're well-informed. These ladies um, are a force to be reckoned with. And I have a lot of friends that support the advocacy of a metastatic breast cancer. Same with um, prostate cancer in men. That is a very informed group. Mm -hmm. And they are happy to come to any, uh, any kind of program, seminar, anything like that. They are, they are there to support the men in the group that have uh, prostate cancer. So it's, it's interesting. It's, um, it's something that was kind of my way to give back hmm. to serve as, uh, you know, the, the person at the table that can sit with different researchers and oncologists and teams. So I think that, um, you know, for your survivors out there, this is an option. Tell your story. And um, the advocate listens a lot too. That's, that's really great. Listens. Mm -hmm. Key. Yeah. And, and that can be there if you're struggling, you know, right. And especially if you get a patient advocate who like yourself has had the experience, that's even more of a bonus, I think, to be able right. to have that. Yeah. And I'm sure it's not everyone that does, but boy, when you get that, it's like you run, you run the lottery. No, so to speak, right? Um, yes, yeah. to have that kind of level of support. Um, okay, is there anything else about patient advocacy that that we need to say before we move on to the to the cost, which everybody's probably wondering? 
I just I want to do a quick plug for Bob Rose, who is also a patient advocate that serves with our, our clinical trials program or phase one clinical trials, and he does countless other things, but he and his wife have a support group. Um, and Chris, do you have his phone number for for everyone or we can get that information back out to Patty? Yeah, but, and um, we can put it in the show notes for sure. Absolutely. Um, Bob and his wife are tremendous and such a huge help to patients and um, they're they're wonderful. So that is a really safe place for people to go and share concerns and get answers. And um, so I just wanted to give Bob a shout out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he, he and Ethel, I always joke, I want to be Bob and Ethel when I grow up because um, they truly are amazing. They've been running this support group out of their home for like the last 27 years, wow. every Tuesday night. Um, and he is the cancer survivor, thanks to investigational medicine and their whole group focuses on helping people find clinical trials. Yep. That is exact. That is specifically what his group really focuses on. And yeah, I don't know, Fabulous. Bob's like 90 and he's still working just for fun. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> Bob is busier than all of us. Yes. <laughs> that's a great, that's an important plug then. That's a very important. Yep. We'll definitely, if you guys get that information to us, we'll make sure we put it in the show notes for um, when we. I sure uh, will. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Cost. I'm sure a lot of people are going like, what's this going to cost me though? What if my insurance doesn't cover it? So help me help our viewers understand, you know, what the cost involved for participating in the clinical trial. I'll take this one because we do have patients traveling quite a lot um, to come to us. And, and we are not all uh, often we're not their primary oncologist. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so their insurance will capitate them a lot of times to where they're being treated. And then they want to come to us for a clinical trial. Well, there's aspects of the clinical trial that are truly investigational and those have to be covered by the study. Um, it's just not an option to bill insurance for investigational treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so they're co it's covered by the study. When that particular thing is covered by the study, though, it has to be done at the center that okay. is conducting the clinical trial. There's no option to take it back home. Okay. Um, but then there are other things that we talked about a little bit earlier called routine care. And those things would happen whether you were on a clinical trial or you're getting just regular treatment. You're going to get labs, you're going to get scans, you're going to see your doctor. Um, so some of those things are built to insurance. Most of them can go back to wherever the patient lives. Their primary oncologist will order them through that, through their primary oncologist. That gets them back in network, you know, whatever, you know, a lot of times it's just better for them. It's also for many patients is closer to home too. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple things that cannot, they're billed to insurance, but they cannot go back to the primary oncologist. One is you have to see the doctor that is legally responsible for the trial for those checkups. So if Dr. Bell sends us a patient, Dr. Bell can still see the patient, but Dr. Bell cannot be the one to say, it looks like you're okay to continue on the study treatment. That has to be our doctor here that does that. Okay. And that's billed to insurance. And sometimes that's out of network. Um, the other thing is, is even though the drug is investigational and that's going to be free, you got to pay the nurses to give it to you if it's yeah. an infusion. Yeah. So that's another thing. We cannot take the investigational agent outside of the contracted monitored location Okay. Um, for drug accountability. Again, very strict uh, rules around that. So um, those have to, those will a lot of times be out of network charges. Um, Kaiser uh, has their Medicare Senior Advantage plan, which does not provide any outpatient benefits outside of Kaiser. But once a patient is actually enrolled on a clinical trial, it is a Medicare rule that they get access to Medicare. Um, mm, so there could be the 20% on some of those things uh, that they would normally cost them like $10 if it was done at Kaiser. But the nice thing about Kaiser is they will allow the patients to submit whatever they pay, had to pay out of pocket and get reimbursed and made up the difference. Oh, wow. Okay. So Kaiser is very, very good about that um, and making patients whole when there's, you know, and Kaiser does clinical trials too. So if yeah. they can do it at home, that's even better. But when they don't, when they come to us, 
uh, yeah. we all work together to make sure that we, we do what we can to try to keep the patients whole as best we can. But you have to have insurance of some kind. Yeah, so. and I would think, um, I mean, it's a, this is my, I'm not in your wheelhouse here, okay? So my question comes from, it's a win-win. Clinical trials need, you know, people to do the trials with so that they know whether or not, like, do we have a winner here? Is this, mm -hmm. you know, this treatment is good. We can, now we know, and we can give it to more people. So it's a win-win for everyone. So I would think that there is some advantage to the institution who's running it to want to give some level of reimbursement because, I mean, that that's at least my naive understanding. Well, and even for, you know, when we work with each other, we want to make our patients whole, right. you know, uh, right. even when we right. send them to somebody else, we want to find a way to make them whole. So most centers are really good about, about trying to do that. Well, so, and so you're UC Davis, right, Chris? Mm -hmm. And so is UC Davis, if I don't have UC Davis and I have, um, I have Sutter, you know, so um, is Sutter... Uh, are UC Davis clinical trials only for UC Davis patients or can someone who no. has Sutter? Oh, okay, great. No, that, uh, um, even Sutter's clinical trials are not just for Sutter patients. Okay, okay, <laughs> so, great. Um, it's really important. So by work, all of us working together, together. So we also work with UCSF and Stanford as well. And we send patients back and forth sure. amongst ourselves. Yeah. Um, you know, we all have a responsibility. We've all been given a charge. Okay. We get federal dollars. We've all been given a charge. We must serve our community, the entire community. So especially the comprehensive cancer centers like UC Davis and UCSF and, and Stanford, we get evaluated every five years. And if we don't show that we're serving our entire, we have a 19 county catchment area and we just went through our renewal. If we don't show that we are serving the entire 19 counties, we don't get the money again. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Sutter is accredited through the American College of Surgeons. They have similar charges. So all of us have a responsibility to show that we are serving everybody in our community, not just the people in our center. I would like to pop in real fast um, because I work with the American Cancer Society and as the representative from the society into the greater Sacramento area, this is a very, very rich area for tremendously great oncology services. You, When you think about, I mean, our landmass is big. Mm -hmm. Our population isn't huge. So for instance, Toronto, Ontario, Canada is the fourth largest city in North America. They have two cancer centers. Well, we've got five in just the greater Sacramento area alone. So this is a tremendously rich area for great oncology and terrific survivorship. And I think as a patient, um, and, and, and to have the support down the road also of UCSF and, and Stanford. I mean, and to be honest with you, as a patient, unless my circumstances are extraordinary, there's no reason for a patient in the greater Sacramento area to have to go down the road. Hmm. You, you are cared for right here. And this is just me not representing any one of the, the hospitals or centers, cancer centers. This is me saying, this is a really great community that um, the beauty of, of Dr. Bell at Sutter and Chris at UC Davis and everybody at Dignity, Kaiser, they all truly do work together. Yeah. And so, um, you're you're well cared for here as a patient and i think that trust is is hugely important there's so many people taking care of the cancer patient here in these communities it's a, it's really great yeah. well that is even a, our private practice uh sierra hematology oncology yeah. has access yeah. to clinical trials through us and dignity mm -hmm. and sutter so they're very very active uh in referring patients for clinical trials as well so I wanted to make sure they were a part of the conversation too. 
Well, that's, that's a really great note to tie this all together and end it with. It's very inspirational and um, enlightening and, I, and hopefully instills confidence in people who are listening and saying, oh, wow. I mean, I really appreciate you pointing all that out, Teresa. And um, so because of time, no surprise that we run over because this topic is chunky and there's a lot to it. Um, so we're going to need to end, but I want last things, you know, Dr. Bell, any, anything you, last message you'd love to tell any of the viewers that are, are listening to this crucial uh, webinar? Yes, I would like to say, like Chris said, ask your oncologist about clinical trials, uh, you know, or, uh, and it does not mean that you have to, like has already been said, that you have to be at the end of the road or there's nothing else to do, so you should do a clinical trial. Sometimes right at the beginning, we might have a great trial. Uh, so not only do you help yourself, you are also helping people who will come after you and you will be well cared for when you're on a clinical trial. That's awesome. Anybody I'll, else? I'll just end by saying, yeah, I'll, I'll just end by saying that when you're on a clinical trial, you still have access to everything else. So you still have access to the palliative care team, the survivorship. This is just another treatment option to be discussed. So it's just something that adds to everything else that you already have. Yeah, and don't give up. Um, you know, you might not qualify for the trial right away, but there are trials coming out daily. And so, um, you know, if you if you want to be on a trial, keep keep trying because sooner sooner or later there will be something right for you. Oh, that's great. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been awesome. This has been a dream to have this kind of conversation with, with experts like you. So I really, really appreciate all the time that you've given me today and given Wellness Within. Um, I'm going to tell all our viewers that we will have show notes and you'll give me some information. Um, anything that you think would be important, like a link, a resource, whatever, we'll include it in here so people can have it. So just let us know before um, so that all the people knowing this, like, look, there's some important resource here. Just scroll down and go check it out. So for all our viewers here, thank you so much for watching and uh, hopefully you did some pauses because this is long, yeah, but it's worth sticking it out. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Thank you, Chris. And thank you so much, Teresa. I really appreciate your time. Take care.